morning and good evening. Uh, my name is John Vivango, publisher of The Elephant. And this morning, we are honored to, well, it's morning in, uh, in, in Chicago is where you are, uh, Professor. And so we're honored to have with us Professor Adia Benton, uh, who is a professor of social anthropology at the North, at University of Northwestern in, in, in Chicago. And uh, Adia is also a um, winner of the Carson Prize for her book, HIV Exceptionalism, Development Through Disease in Sierra Leone. And I'll be hoping that we can maybe touch on it uh, in, our, in our conversation, Professor. So thank you very much for, for uh, uh, joining us at The Elephant. Uh, a big time difference, it's, early, it's, it's in the morning, uh, where in, where you are in Chicago, it's it's early evening here in Nairobi. Um, thank you very much for for joining us. Um, can I just just straight straight off before anything? Ask how are you keeping? Um, how's how how are you and your family cope, coping with? It's sort of it's already become a sort of tired sort of term with this new normal with the, with the lockdown um, mm -hmm. and the disruption that COVID nineteen has caused. Given the fact that you've studied pandemics uh, as a scholar and and these kind of disruptions uh, as a scholar for quite some time, but how how's it treating you personally? What uh, how are you managing? It's you know it's it's been tough. It's we, you know I think we've been sheltering in place since the middle of March, yeah. and it's <laughs> so it's it's been quite a long time. Um, the children are at home, um, which means that. You know, I'm I'm having to manage that with you know, well, me and my and my spouse, we're we're managing that um, pretty. I think well as well as we can. And because you know, I'm also teaching teaching uh, at the university remotely, so I'm you know basically struck that that not struggling, <laughs> but but definitely um, having to juggle a lot of different things, different part, different things. Um, you know. What, what are we going to do? We're all in the same boat and there are a few essential workers in the house. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. Oh, I mean, um, uh, Prof, I mean, you, you have studied, um, you have studied sort of, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a social anthropologist, you've, you, you know, you've studied, um, the way that, um, uh, pandemics, epidemics, uh, whether it's HIV, Ebola, etc., um, sweep through communities and the changes they make and how communities cope. And you know, you've done work in West Africa on it. And uh, what are your sort of uh, ruminations about the behavior of COVID nineteen, and then our reaction to it as as <laughs> as human beings, nation states? Uh, we, we can see the disruption it's caused us. We're, we're both being, we're all both talking on Zoom, and uh, and well, and I'm, I'm able to find academics like you now uh, because I know everyone's locked in one place. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, so um, one of the things that I've been thinking about. So when you ask me how am I coping uh, during the lockdown, it's been a really long one. Um, one of the things that I remember during uh, the West African Ebola outbreak. So when Sierra Leone was affected, one of the first, well, not one of the first interventions, but one of the more criticized interventions was this very long, it was like three week lockdown. So they started with curfews. Um, and what, what happened, what was controversial about those, those um, curfews was that poor people were expected to stay at home, but the elites were going to parties at the hotels and get, you know, so I remember seeing on Facebook, oh, you know, you told us to stay home, but I saw all the, the rich people and the white people at the hotel bar and pool. Um, <laughs> and so there was a lot of shaming around that. And so when these, when these lockdowns happened, yes. one of the things that, that many public health experts were trying to say is, is, if you want people to stay home, if you really need, if you think that this is going to be an intervention that can actually work, you need to provide for people. You need to make sure that they have, you have to understand what their needs would be. How will the intervention actually um, affect the day-to-day -day life? Because the thing is, is the disease is the most important thing for public health 
the disease is the most important thing for the government, but it's not the most important thing for the people in the community. No. They need to eat. They need to, they need to, they need to go continue the work of, of making a life. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I, I'm not sure if it really worked, but one of the things that did come out of that was that recognition that you actually have to consult with communities and understand their needs and understand how that, how shutting down everything um, is, is actually affect how interventions themselves are become a part of the social fabric is, is kind of how, how I frame it. Uh -huh. um, and so the public health apparatus as it existed, you tried to use that opportunity to do health outreach. Um, so to explain how it is the disease gets transmitted in, in sort of lay local terms, but also to identify potential cases yeah. and, and try to isolate them and, tr and, and, and offer treatment. Um, but again, you have to have systems that are very much oriented towards the care of people, not the punishment, not the discipline, not the restriction, not the containment. And I think that's often where we lose sight. That's what we lose sight of during these kinds of outbreaks is what ultimately happens is the existing rifts in a society, the existing inequalities in the society. Yes. All of the challenges related to labor and work and health all kind of come together and cause problems for, it, for, for both the state apparatus, but also the people who are supposed to be experiencing the intervention. Yeah. Um, um, that, that allows me to ask a question which has been sort of bothering me as well, you know, like many people, I'm sort of also under lockdown, so spending quite a bit of time trying to understand uh, this pandemic and its impact on society. You know, it sort of caused me to ask somebody who, you know, of, of your background and experience and sitting where you are at Northwestern, um, a question of something which has been of some, um, which has caused you know, some intrigue and, and uh, uh, just tremendous interest here. Um, uh, and that is the fact that um, in, in a number of many US cities, um, despite uh, making up only a, a small part or just a major minority in the population, the black communities have been disproportionately impacted by, by in terms of hospitalization and deaths from COVID-19. Um, and, you know, that's not only the case in the U.S., it's also in, in uh, parts of Europe. And, and, you know, I would ask just a sort of simple layman's question, if, if, you'll, allow, if you'll allow, what's going on? Um, What's, what's, uh... So, you know, that, that's an interesting question um, because, I, you know, I've, in some ways I, I anticipated it, but, you know, you kind of don't want to say <laughs> that, that, this, that you expect the, that you expect existing inequalities to manifest in, in, these, in these terrible health outcomes, but it's sort of, it's what's happened before. Yeah. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, we, we recognize that, and it's not just our cities, actually. Yes. So, so what we, I think we're definitely going to, well, we are seeing this in, in our, in some of our rural areas um, as well. But what we're, what we're seeing is the, the long term or the, the after effects um, of a series of, I guess, dispossessions and um, discrimination. So what, you know, like uh, we, we have, uh, you know, in the US, our insurance, our, our, the way that we finance healthcare is, is, is bizarre, right? <laughs> Most health insurance is provided through work, uh, through, through your job. And then there's a sort of state, state supplement kind of health insurance as well. And what you see is that if you aren't, you know, you don't necessarily receive, get access to primary care um, regularly unless you kind of fall, you either have to fall into a certain category of, of very low income or you have to have certain kind of work. Yeah. Um, and so there's that, but then there's all these other things that contribute to poor health that are linked to where we live, where, so residential segregation is an issue. Yes. Um, and so if you have higher environmental exposure to a certain kinds of environmental toxins that 
you know, change your respiratory function. Um, if you have, so there's a, like a lot of the situations in which we find themselves that shape our health, our ability to, to, to have access to good health care, but also good health. It, it's, it's already disproportionately affecting black and brown people. people. It's already affecting very poor people. And if you have a higher concentration of, of poverty amongst those populations and it, you know where people live, how they access care, all of those things matter, then we're talking about greater susceptibility um, to, to, to death, to premature death for one, that's one piece of it. But then there's all of these other things. So they, the pre-existing conditions thing that you've heard about, like people who already have um, asthma or other respiratory issues, but also work, right? Like if you're an essential worker, That's you're right. driving buses, if you work in a grocery store, if you're, you know, like if you do all of these things that are, if you work in a warehouse, if you work in a meat packing plant, all of these things, which are often, again, segregated sectors, yes. you're talking about increased risk being concentrated amongst a particular group of people. So that's why we're seeing these issues. And that's why you're going to see it in rural areas as well, because in the US, that's where our prisons are. Oh yeah. So our big prisons, that's where our agricultural industries, so the, the sort of all of the meat processing and, and all of that stuff, it's where warehouses often are situated. So there's some urban at warehouses, but there are also a bunch of, so we're talking about these really, we're talking about um, how the outbreak is constant or how this disease is being concentrated among certain sectors and within certain neighborhoods. And, you know, depending on your household, like, are you living in multi generational households? Are you living in, um, you know, it, so that, I mean, I talk to people about this all the time, you know, because I have, you know, friends who are like, oh, my cousin's a police officer. And they share a home with grandmother, cousin, whatever. So we're talking about all of these these different factors that shape uh, risk. So I mean, I would say, I mean, I know I, it was sort of a long-winded answer, <laughs> but it's it's sort of all of these all of these things kind of come together to shape people's risk. And that's the kind of question that you constantly have to ask yourself when you're looking at epidemics. How is risk shaped by the, the way people live their lives? And, and how are their lives shaped by these kind of broader social, political, economic structures? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, thank you. I mean, that, that, that is, is uh, um, it's also an issue um, in, in, a, in a country like Kenya, uh, mm -hmm. Zimbabwe. Uh, South Africa. Um, um, South Africa has had one of the best responses of the African continent to the, to, to the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Um, but you have to keep in mind that you know these are former apartheid um, societies, and and in some cases the um, the old structure of of both the state and society and the relationship between uh, citizens and their state wasn't changed um, more than superficially, you know? Uh, so we still have a, a, a small elite um, that behaves very much uh, in the way that um, the colonial elite behaved. And one of the trends, which is the cause of considerable debate here, and I'm sure you, you know, you've seen it and we have an opinion on it, is that the measures that are implemented to, um, by, by, by nation states to manage um, the behavior of people uh, in an effort to stem this kind of pandemic, um, often involve a level of securitization um, that can be very, very disruptive. Um, and, you know, just to use a term that you used, um, uh, the these these interventions become part of the can, can become part of the social fabric and I, and I, I don't know whether I understood you properly on that because one of the concerns we have here is that some of the um, restrictions vis-a-vis um, -vis movement the involvement of uh, the police force and military in other places in in the management of how people behave in, in public spaces um, the powers which states sometimes abrogate to themselves um to 
to monitor and trace uh, their population and uh, concern that these kind of changes can become quite resilient. Um, that three years from now when COVID is uh, no, maybe not, no, not no longer there, but we have a completely different, we manage it with a completely different perspective towards it. There's a concern that, um, that, that some of these changes can become quite resilient and restructure society. Uh, I'd be keen what, what your comment would be to that kind of uh, um, reflection. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think you're right. And I think one of the things that, you know, we're learning or I guess relearning here in the, in the States, I mean, I, I can speak specifically to the question of securitization, but what I wanted to say is, is when we're, a lot of what this is causing is austerity, right? Yeah. And so what we're getting is we're going to pull back on all of these different things. And, and when we get back to normal, we'll restore them. But no, that's not what's going to happen. And I think we, we are, many of us are, are correct to worry that austerity measures that we learn to live with actually become the normal. And that's actually why we have this problem with public health, and at least in our country, I think to some extent actually throughout the continent as well, yes. is that at some point an austerity measure in the 80s, in the 1980s, basically shaped a lot of our health systems, you know, right? They said, oh, you don't really need this hospital or you don't need this many beds in your yeah. hospital you don't you don't need this many people in your civil service payroll yeah. you don't need why don't you just have more community health workers yeah. <laughs> who are volunteers right yeah. and so that ultimately shaped um a lot of what we're seeing it kind of created the problem that we are seeing in a lot of the countries that that we're that we're familiar with and that we're talking about but this question too about so one of the things that also happened with austerity is that even though I'd say military gets cut back here and there, it still ends up having a lot of, because of how militaries are professionalized, yeah. how some of our, at least in the States, we have, a, I mean, definitely pro more professionalized in Africa because of initiative taken by imperial powers, right? Yeah, um, but the police as well, they end up having some of the expertise that we would like our public health sector to have. That's right. right? And so what ends up happening is, and this actually happened in Sierra Leone, where during the Ebola outbreak, the president said, hey, the Ministry of Health is not handling this properly. I want to put the Ministry of Defense in charge. Uh -huh. Which people, you know, no, I, you know, we're skeptical. We, re, we hear that and we're like, oh no. <laughs> it, either they're trying to make the, the general a president or, you know, something is happening here, right? And I think there's something to be said about the fact that even President Trump is saying things like, oh, this is a war against our invisible enemy. And so at that point, the logic of the National Guard makes sense. The idea that, that frontline workers can be sacrificed, yes. um, those become part of the logics of how security kind of infiltrates and fills in, you know, and, and starts to substitute for the possibility of care, right? Like that's when we start to reimagine our relationship vis-a-vis -vis the state, vis-a-vis -vis the military, vis-a-vis -vis health as, as somehow um, inextricably linked. Yes. So the violence, the violence becomes um, the point and the back, sort of the backstop, right? So what happens if I leave my house without a mask. Yes. Well, the police are going. The police are going to force you to put one. They're going to beat you up. They're not going to hand out more masks, right? <laughs> That'd be nice. Yes. They're going to beat you up or arrest you. Yeah. Um, or we're or we start to. So one of the things I was telling uh, someone I was talking to, I said it's really funny how like I I spend a lot of my time on Twitter because you know I have to entertain myself. Um, but, but I noticed that there are people posting pictures They'll go, oh, today was sunny. And did you see all those people were not social distancing? Yeah. It's like, we all become, we become police. That's a very we good. become judge. Yeah. We become jury. Yes. You know, instead of thinking, well, you know what? We've been sitting in the house for eight weeks. Yes. I think, you know, like I can understand why someone would want to be outside in the sunshine, in the grass. Like, you know, I'm not, sometimes we're not, I'm not going to be saying, you know what, 
if I'm outside, maybe I'll get sick. You know, like, I don't know. It's, it's sort of a funny thing to say, but it, we, we need to really think about what it is that these interventions are doing to people and like how we can imagine these as relations of care and not of punishment, of discipline, or, or of discipline even, right? Like, yep. Oh, <laughs> you know, this, I don't know. It's, it's a very, I'm, 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 I'm still thinking about it, but yep. I'm, I'm, I'm struck by how quickly we become, we all become cops. We all become, we're delegated, you know, <laughs> delegated the police force or whatever. We're, 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 the, we're the, so, the COVID-19 deputized police. Uh, right. That's a really interesting point, yeah, because that's been a concern um, growing in, 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 in many quarters and people are sort of, uh, you know, uh, meditating over it and studying it. Um, and which brings me to another question, which which I'll I'll be keen to to get your your opinion on. That is, you know, directly related to to it. I mean, there appear to be two two broad schools of of thought in terms of how to respond to this crisis. Um, of course, very nuanced uh, in each in each in each sort of nation state context. In the, in the case of the U.S., uh, where you have a federal system, there are differences between. Um, state and state, and, 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 and of course, you have a, a very unique federal response. Um, but um, <laughs> everything falls into two, two, two sort of um, buckets. Um, you have essentially uh, the model which was adopted, which, which was, was adopted in Asia and, and I'll say almost perfected there, um, of, you know, once you identify the, you know, um, the hot spot, as it were, you you test, um, you know, you trace, you treat. So, you know, the kind of interventions we, we saw in Wuhan, in China, uh, and we see a number of Asian Asian countries. Uh, lots of Europe eventually went into the same um, uh, approach to, to this particular p- pandemic, um, which, uh, like the way you describe it. Um, uh, you're essentially throwing your economy at at, at, a, at a pandemic, uh, so it, the effect is is, is austerity, and um, but that has been one model in 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 Sweden, for example, um, um, in the UK initially as well, and one has heard similar mutterings from different parts of the US as well. Um, the other model is says that um, actually. Um, with a virus like this, what you want is to reach a sort of critical mass of of the population that has been infected and has antibodies, and, you, know, that, you know. And so, this concept of herd immunity um, that that sort of emerged um, and uh, is 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 something that is being discussed. And obviously, um, uh, is, is, is a cause of some debate. I'll be keen for your for your opinion ab- about that debate um, and um, what works in what context uh, better. It, it, it seemed as if you know China was able to do certain things because it is China and it has this sort of uh, unique governance system. Um, but now yeah. democratic countries also attempting to do similar lockdowns and restrictions that uh, are much more difficult in a free and open society. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, one thing I, I, I kind of want to think about, or, or maybe, I don't know if it's a caution, but so I would say one thing that China did, though, is China actually just, they did one area, right? Like, they yeah. just said, hey, this is a hot spot, and they did whatever it is that they did in that space. So they locked that place down. We're talking about a country with lots more people. So if everybody else was moving fairly smooth, you know, moving fluidly, I think there was still um, kind of regional, regional spread. But, but what happened was, you know, I mean, I think their issue was things got out of hand really quickly and they then uh, sort of locked everything down. But that's from, also from their experience with SARS, their experience with, so they actually had experience with this and they kind of just sort of went back to an old model that they're used to. Okay. Um, and, and, and just sort of took that part. So I would say they actually represent one way. So you then have other places like say Taiwan 
Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea that actually did what that stuff that you're talking about, which was actually we don't really want to shut things down. What we're going to do is rapidly identify these cases, do rapid contact. So, so it's not that China, what China did the contact tracing, China did the isolation, China did all of those things. They built massive hospitals in 10 days. Yeah. Um, but, but, but South Korea and Taiwan said things like, okay, actually, we think we can handle this if we do what I call the bread and butter of public health. So we don't necessarily, restrictions are your last resort. They're not your first, they're not your, you don't take the biggest hammer for that nail. <laughs> you take, you take the hammer that you need for that nail. Exactly. And then if you, it's only when you have multiple nails that you get the big hammer and pull it out. Right. Okay. So, so they said, okay, what we really need to do is scale up the testing. We need to make sure that we have we, we can test almost anyone who needs one. Yes. We can't presume that just because they have, that somebody doesn't have symptoms that they're not testable. Yes. We should test the people who, because they come in contact because we, it seems that they're all of this community spread and not everyone knows when they've been in contact with someone. Yes. And so, we, and so there, people are still moving freely, but the understanding is that you need tests. And once you have tested positive, you go into isolation. You isolate yourself. Yes. And so I'm not sure yes. if, if Taiwan or South Korea did this, but if I were running that situation, I would say, okay, here is a place where you check in, you check into your isolation room, you get, you know, you get your meals, slip, you know, you get your meals, you get your care. And then after three weeks when you've, you know, gotten over whatever you've gotten over, you move on. Yes. So there, there's that. Much. And then there's this kind of like, so, so for some reason, even though this isn't part of the pandemic plans that many of us, many of our states uh, prepare, a lot of them just went into lockdown okay. um, after realizing that things just got out of hand. Like they weren't doing that contact tracing, the bread and butter, as I call it. They haven't been doing the testing. We still don't have adequate testing capacity in the United States after all these weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, if we had had, I actually, sometimes I wonder if we had had this happen 30 years ago, actually, no, that wouldn't we because we actually had a problem with HIV yeah. um, and, and continue to have it. Um, but one of the things that, you know, if we had had, so this is where the Africa part comes in, because, that, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about having worked all over the continent, um, especially uh, in West Africa, is if I were a a health person and I said you know what I really need I need health I need health workers I need people who can do contact tracing I need someone who can help with the isolation you know I need people who can do I could I could mobilize something yeah. fairly quickly yes um and you know we're just now at this point in these in the states where we're you know, hiring people to do contact tracing and hiring people to do all of these things. Um, you know, for some reason, Google said they were going to make an app <laughs> to trace everyone. And, and instead of thinking, you know, not thinking about the privacy issues. And I was like, make an app that contact tracers can use so they can go around and do this stuff. You can have people, you still can hire people to do things without forcing a smartphone into the equation. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there, so there are, I think, what, what, what I, what I'm, I guess we have, I guess maybe it's three schools, which is the, you know, like, there's this Wuhan sort of hybrid model that, that does all of the things, yes. but it also does the big hammer, <laughs> you know, it, it does the big hammer plus other things. Yes. There, there are these countries like Taiwan and, um, and South Korea that have, have opted for, I mean, I won't call it high tech, but really yes. high, high concentration of, 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 of human and technical resources to do public health properly. Correct. And then us, you know, the, everybody else, including many of the, the, the African countries, I would say places like Ethiopia and Rwanda, they started their screening very early. Yes. So maybe they'll have, you know, maybe they'll be okay. Yes. Um, and maybe some of the West African countries that are developing rapid diagnoses and doing genomic sequencing and all of those yes. things. But what we're really um, struggling with is the fact that we didn't have that real commitment to building institutions and infrastructure, or at least trying to come in, step in, and, and, and generate that response immediately. Um, 
so and and that's the thing like uk like what are they they were like is let people die let people die and then they realize that that just doesn't work <laughs> like it starts to get bad really fast right <laughs> Um, Sweden, Sweden is probably also going to have this. Oh, we thought we, <laughs> oh, we thought we could just let people die slowly, and yes. it would. You know, I don't know if they're going to reach herd immunity. Actually, um, I said I'm not sure that Sweden will actually reach herd immunity um, very quickly, or as quickly as they would need to to be able to say that. Because we still don't know actually how long immunity lasts if it does with the coronavirus. Like we're still learning that. Correct. We don't know. Correct. So what if everyone gets it and then they all get it again? <laughs> it's going to be a disaster. Correct. Um, but then it's a disaster for all of us. Because we that in that case it means that we're we're going to be struggling until we have vaccines and adequate treatment. So right now we're just doing what we do, which is treating the symptoms and trying to keep bodies going. Yes. Um, or, you know, whatever. And so I think that's one of the challenges that we're facing. I mean, and people, actually people who get sick and, and live, they're talking about being sick for two or three weeks. Uh -huh. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Three, three weeks of, of being too sick to do much. I mean, even that is a problem. That is. You know, we're talking deaths, deaths, but actually being sick for three weeks, I couldn't, you know, like most, of, there's so much that I won't be able to manage Correct. if I can't get out of bed for that long. Mm. So what are we, you know, what are we, what are we, what are we ultimately trying to do? as people as a as society as a society or as multiple as a global as a global society like you know which which you know you're not you're not quite focused on on um on you're part of a global movement uh, to improve access to quality um surgical care in the poorest countries um mm -hmm. can i can i ask you a bit about that and how um, the COVID-19 is sort of shaping, or you know, some of the ideas that um, you've been uh, supporting uh, in this area vis-a-vis uh, -vis public health. Has, has it accelerated? I mean, I'm sure that, you know, together with your colleagues, this is something that you are, um, you know, uh, you are already advocating for and, and, and studying, um, then COVID-19 comes along. How has it changed? How has it affected your sort of work on, on you know, in pushing for that? That's, that? that's funny that you say that because I started that project in, I think, 20, 2010 maybe. And um, I started, at, you know, I'd finished my HIV book and I said, oh, now I'm going to do the surgery project. So I had been in Mozambique for some t a little bit of time because my, my uh, spouse is a surgeon who had been living in, in Mozambique. And right. so I said, oh, I'm really interested in how the, you know, because the, so basically what the, the thing that was happening at the time was, uh, I think he was the, I think he was a minister, minister of health had been a surgeon who started this project that trained nurses to do some basic surgical techniques. And that started in the fifties when he was, uh, a, he was a doctor in East Timor or something. You know how the, all of the colonial, Yes. All of the colonial people moved through all of it. So this whole Portuguese colonial situation. Yes. So, you know, I was following him because he was doing this sort of socialist model of medicine that was, you know, looking to build is justice movement. It's a justice movement through health. Yes. And so I, a part of the project was to go back to Sierra Leone and do and watch this movement grow. And that's when Ebola actually struck. So my surgery project was derailed by, or I had to stop thinking about it because of Ebola. Um, and in fact, the, this meeting that was supposed to happen, I think it ended up still happening, but I, I had to rethink, well, so do I, you know, do I look at how it affects this or is there something else going on? So ultimately that project it's, it's still on hold, but one of the things that I was trying to argue was that 
you know, this group of people, of surgeons and anesthesia, anesthesia people, obstetrics, all of these folks were trying to say, we are also a part of public health. We are also, if you're going to talk about just health systems, if you're going to talk about um, everybody who needs services getting those services, you have to also talk about surgery. And, and you know, at the time, we're talking about farmers who were getting who had these huge hernias and were you know like no and they can't work and the global metrics were saying things like oh you know it's not bad until it's so big whatever so anyway the the point that i'm I'm ultimately making is that there is an a set there are a set of ideologies guiding what constitutes public health Um, and to, to widen the view of what constitutes public health is to challenge some of the ideological assumptions about poor people, <laughs> the treatment that poor people should have access to, uh, you know, basically this question of deservingness and worth value um, as underlining all of this public health discussion. Um, because uh, even the most progressive public health um, practice is still like hemmed in by this question of cost and value yeah. can i get more out of this at the with the for the least for the smallest price or the lowest price and I, and, I, and it's like well the, the even the price is a sort of social construction right yes. it's a cultural construction yes if you think that the value of life <laughs> is or the number of years life lost or whatever they call it according to you know because of a hernia is has a value then you're already you're already on the wrong track. Yeah. And so to some extent, it, it fits into this bigger question of how we become prepared for this sort of catastrophic outbreak or epidemic that we're seeing now. It, we have to value something different if we're going to actually build systems that can help, that can, can allow people to survive this. Takes me back to a question which I should have asked at the, at the very beginning, um, with you sitting at Northwestern University. Um, what explains America's react, uh, America's response to COVID nineteen? Um, as I said, the whole world is we are watching quite quite fascinated, uh, but um, you know, um, on, of course, there's a bit of slight, not, not, not a bit, quite a bit of bewilderment. On the one hand, you have people who, who, who clearly know, um, uh, you know, really know what to do in these types of situations. Um, but but there has been uh, a considerable amount of um, un, unequalness and and uh, variety in, in in the way U.S. has responded to it as the world's richest country. Um, I think prior prior to COVID nineteen, it was the world's one of the one amongst the world's sort of five six most prepared countries in the world in, for, for 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 a pandemic from from a, from a you know. Right. Of, um, yeah, I I, I um, I'm not going to talk about the provenance of, <laughs> but I I mean I'll I'll, I'll check out, but I've I've seen the the, the chart in terms of. Um, by 2019, which countries in the world were most prepared? And I think you know, the, the U.S. was uh, was 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 up there in terms of being ready to face a pandemic. Um, developments have been rather right. different. So, you know, I so part of my research is also about metrics. Yeah. And uh, and the idea of list making, right? And so um, one of the things is is if if you if you make your own report card, if you're the designer of your own rubric for grading, then often you are the person who does the best yeah. on your own report card. I mean, like, let's just be real. If your metrics are the ones, right? Yeah. So, and that's often the case for all of these indices that are about ranking, you know, that are about ranking the, the best or, or yeah. the the most whatever right and and at some point when those metrics become the benchmarks that you impose then those become the you know so those those are the things that you strive for for preparedness but they may not actually measure what it means to be prepared yeah in the real world sort of real life right 
And so we're being tested. Um, but we also, so I think there are a few things about um, the United States <laughs> that, that make it um, actually quite uh, vulnerable to something like this. And, and, the and it's not simply like that we didn't have enough ventilators or PPE or whatever, but we have had, again, when I was talking about austerity, you know, we've, we've had decades of sort of rollbacks when it comes to health systems. So this sort of for-profit model of medicine has absolutely made it difficult for places that have um, a lot of, they basically have a lot of poverty, they have a lot of inequality, et cetera, it makes it very difficult for hospitals to stay open and, yes. to, and to keep running. So we do have some city and state run or public hospitals, um, but they are far and few between. Um, we have these, you know, as long as profit is sort of a part of that. Um, the other piece is that public health function is, is I think, minimal. So we have, because you, you know, we have this federal system and state system. And so all of these municipal, generally what happens, the way public health operates in the states is, you know, every state has like a public health department. And then maybe whatever municipalities or, or counties or whatever might have their own. But those are financed very differently. So New York City Health Health department may have more than some whole states <laughs> would have for their public health allotment. Um, so not which isn't to say that New York City's public health department is funded at the level it should be funded, but it certainly is better funded than a lot of other places um, because it has a and it has a long history. And in fact, if you run the New York City Health Department, that's like a stepping stone to some other big job ultimately, right? So these big city, so we have all of these, but who you know, who does the bread and butter? So we have, you know, epidemiologists, health educators, uh, health communications experts, environmental health, we have all of that stuff that those people are supposed to be doing. But again, will we be able to, who do we have to go and do contact tracing? Who will be out doing that? Like who manages that process? Yes. Especially in a rural county that's hard hit, which did happen in Washington state, right? Washington state was one of the first states to have a massive um, outbreak. But they also had happened to have a university uh, research project that also happened to be doing a flu study. Uh -huh. And so they were able to set up, make their own diagnostic tests Yes. Um, early and, and kind of deal with that problem and use their staff for contact tracing. So it, they were lucky. Okay. They were lucky in that regard. They were able to say, oh, nursing homes are the cause. They, and they started their lockdowns and tracing early. And I think they're doing uh, significantly better and may reopen. But, you know, we, we have this, we have a bunch of other centralized uh, health agencies as well. So everyone's heard of the CDC because they're in movies and they show them on planes coming to investigate the outbreak or whatever, like superheroes, right? Where are they now? You know, they, they messed up a lot. They messed up with the diagnostic test. They messed up with, and we don't even see the head of the agency speaking independent of the president. The president has a daily press briefing. Actually, I'm not sure if it's daily anymore, but I used to watch them where he contradicts the experts, where he, um, you know, he, well, contradicting them is the, is the first part, but where he also kind of over, tries to overshadow their expertise. And so what we're dealing with is this, this sort of weird political landscape where many of the agencies, many of the organizations that we would expect to be running the lead are not doing so. Yes. And it's not clear yes. whether that's through presidential decree or if it's because um, we are sort of realizing the limitations of our institutions more generally. I would say it can't be that because the CDC also did one of the largest interventions in the history of the agency in West Africa during the Ebola crisis. So we know that they have the ability to deploy and focus on one issue um, under, under conditions of emergency, mm -hmm. but what is stopping them from being able to do that and to run the lead under these circumstances? It's not clear. 
I'm trying to figure, you know, that's something that I'm actually trying to understand because part of my, my research with Sierra Leone is about understanding that relationship between the CDC, the US CDC and, and Sierra Leone. Yeah. But also now we have Africa CDC, so hi. <laughs> You know, I, which I'm very excited about, actually, because they've actually done quite a lot of work in Africa this over this during COVID. They've been in, in the past three years that they've been in existence, you know, even though the I think the director only got his actual physical office a few months ago, they've been doing emergency relief efforts all over the continent. Yes. Um, they've been sending health workers. They've been sending epidemiologists. Correct. Um, the head of that CDC used to work at the US CDC. So we, you know, what I'm getting at is the capacity should be there yeah. to some extent, enough. Um, and we're, but we're not seeing that leadership and we're not seeing that, the, the sort of benefits of that in, in our country. Yes. Um, just one, one final question as we close uh, at the end is, um uh if 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 covid-19 were as you said it's it's a, it's a major stress test even to developed countries um and uh, what 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 are the most important lessons that should be should be that should emerge from from this pandemic um in in terms of how um public health systems are are are, de are designed um, I mean, it, it seems to me, I, I know for, for us here in Africa who implemented structural adjustment programs that essentially defunded um, a lot of health, uh, privatized it, so it's very fragmented. So there's a bit of rethinking of, of, of that model because it's, it's, it's one which doesn't really help the majority of the population in this kind of situation and, and others as well. Um, so, but if, if, if you, you know, what are some of the takeaways for, for those who are designing the health systems that, that are supposed not only to respond to something like uh, COVID-19, but supposed to keep an entire population uh, in a reasonable state of health? Um, you know, I think it seems like, I, I feel like we often dance around this, <laughs> which is, um, there was there were a series of initiatives leading into austerity so right before austerity and 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 that progressive movement died with austerity but well maybe it didn't die i think it sort of persists we still have a people's health movement which emerged out of that that moment but in the late 70s we finally had i think a, a kind of global agreement that we needed something that looked like primary care primary primary health care i mean while i think it it also was too biased to the question of cost and low tech um, sort of appropriate technologies i think it might it, it the, the spirit and underlying it the ideologies driving it would would be um really useful right now and and that was to really situate to start from the bottom <laughs> you know to really imagine health starting in communities yes so and, and, you know, I was talking to this uh, Ghanaian scholar who, whose mother was a, he, a, tra a traditional healer in, in the poorest region. Yes. And he was saying, you know, he told me, he said, you know, my mom used to be the front line. If she, even though she wasn't uh, hired by the government, she said, if she, you know, she, when people came to her for help to get, you know, to get something for their health problem, if she saw something that was unusual and that she knew her herbs would not help, she would report it to the health unit. And then that person would go and, and all of that stuff. And so it was like an early warning system that ultimately helped to kind of, you know, so if, if there were, had been an outbreak of Ebola in 1972 under, you know, Africanized Ghanaian health, socialized Ghanaian health system, yes. this would have, it would have stopped early it would have stopped at, at that in the village in, in the forest region and so i would say you're starting with communities yeah. um, however that's defined um we even had that movement in the 70s in the united states where we said let's do neighborhood health centers all of those things sure. so now we're doing nothing nothing you're hiding he, he has not, not been so, um, and so that would be my, my thing, is that we revisit those old models that actually think about the community as the, the sort of starting point, and then build out. 
Um, every yes, we need tertiary level hospitals. Yes, we need you know because that's where your cancer care is. That's where your um, surgeries are. But we also need um, we're going to need those community level responses and everything in between. And so how that that would be my my sort of takeaway. But that's like like I said, that's old school basic public health 101. That's you know, it sounds pie in the sky, but it there's a model and it exists. Um, and it would be really interesting to kind of rejuvenate or rethink that. I mean, and it, it it's an investment too. Yeah. Um it's something that I wish that we could um have mobilized under the conditions in which we are currently living. If we right. had been able to actually have that conversation and say, yeah, somebody's gonna knock at your door and check your temperature <laughs> and, and make sure you're okay. I, I um, that, that for me, it, 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 it's a powerful note to, to end on. Uh, that ultimately it's about people, it's about community. Uh, and because, you know, one of the panaceas that's, that is being sort of um, whipped out uh, in, in 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 varying forms is is how technology is going to come into it's going to come to the rescue uh, mm -hmm. in terms of COVID nineteen, uh, but um, you know it's very much an, uh, a tool. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not five five new apps. Are not going to be the silver bullet that stops COVID nineteen, is my sense, and I think, that exactly. as you say, it's it's public health one hundred and one. Um, but perhaps that's where we need to go back. That's where COVID nineteen should take us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I yes, absolutely. Great. Well, uh, um, Dr. Adia Benton, I, I I am so so grateful for your time. Uh, the morning your time in the evening here thank you very much I, I i trust we'll be able to come back to you because this uh um covid19 pandemic is changing um so much so quickly and um I'll be very keen to, to, to get here with them and approach um uh, in, in, in a couple of weeks time or and and, and get your uh, uh, yes, your perspectives then as, as, as you continue to process all that's happening around you. But uh, yeah, from Nairobi, I say thank you very much for, for giving us your time. Uh, I'm sure you must be very busy and uh, uh, we hope to be speaking again. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you.